He's my Savior. He's also my friend. Amen? Uh, oh, yeah, kids. I, I don't need to forget you guys. Kids are dismissed to Children's Church. And bless those that are doing the teaching this morning. Amen? In the Bible, Jesus has many conversations with different people. One of the things that we can, when we read the Gospels, look at the Gospels, we see where Jesus was talking with people, and most of the time he was doing the best that he could to bring out a point, to say something. And to many of the people that we read about in the Bible, we see that he has these conversations, and he is trying to get the people that he is in conversation with to come to a certain point, to a certain point. If you would, open up your Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're about to read a piece of Scripture here that is very familiar to probably most everyone sitting here today. I, I think, uh, though, there is something that we can learn and something that we can glean this morning from talking about certain conversations that Jesus had with different people. In John chapter 3, we have the story of a man named Nicodemus coming to talk to Jesus. Probably many of us are familiar with this. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he begins to, to talk to and he asks questions. He, as a matter of fact, he even looks at Nicodemus, or G, Nicodemus looks at Jesus, and he says, we realize you've got to be from God. Okay? Because nobody can do what you do or teach what you teach without having come from God. So Nicodemus comes, and he, he gives Jesus this much. I don't believe, and I don't know that Nicodemus at this particular time was ready to say that Jesus is the Son of God. But he does come and he does say something to the effect of you've got to be from God. In other words, you've got to be a really good man or God is just really blessing you for some special reason. Jesus looks at Nicodemus and recognizing where Nicodemus is coming from, he says these words to Nicodemus. Look at uh, verse 5. Now, let, let, excuse me, let's go back up to, to verse 3. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised by my saying. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And we recognize and we see that what Jesus is trying to get Nicodemus to see and to understand, he is introducing something brand new to Nicodemus. Nicodemus has never heard anything like this before. We, we hear this all the time. This is what we base our Christianity on, is it not? Being born again. Accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life. And in our Christianese, that means being saved, right? That we have been saved. So Jesus has this conversation with Nicodemus, and he brings Nicodemus to a specific place and to a specific point and he helps Nicodemus to understand that what he is telling him is that no longer is it going to be necessary for the, the sacrifices and the things in a short while, in a short time we will not have to worry about these things because what is going to be important is that spirit gives birth to spirit in other words 
by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life, we are spiritually renewed. We are reborn. Then, of course, he keeps talking just a little bit, and then we have probably the most uh, recognized, the most well-known scripture in the Bible at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I love that passage of Scripture, don't you? That whosoever, who, who is whosoever? That's all of us. What is all? Everybody. All inclusive, right? So that, that's for everybody. That's for every single one of us. So Jesus gets his point across to Nicodemus. I'm sure Nicodemus probably walked away uh, that evening and probably was scratching his head and doing some thinking and, and wondering about what he had just heard from Jesus. Something that he had never, ever thought about before in his life. Now, I want you to go over a few chapters here. Go to uh, chapter 14. I want to start at verse 8. Chapter 14, starting at verse 8. Jesus is having a conversation with the disciples, but he has a, a this particular com conversation happens with one in particular disciple named Philip. Verse 8 says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that, uh, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me, the Father, uh, anybody who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son of Man may, may bring glory to the Father. You may ask of me anything in my name and I will do it. Here again we see a conversation happening between Jesus and Philip. And Philip coming to him and asking the question, show us the Father. And I can just almost probably see Jesus go, oh, Philip, brother, have you not been with me these past three years? Have you not seen the feeding of the 5,000? Have you not seen... Uh, the, the many miracles of people who couldn't hear that could hear, the people who couldn't see, see, people who couldn't walk, walk. Have you not seen dead people come to life? And yet Philip wants to ask the question, show us the Father. And Jesus says, Philip, all you've got to do is look and see because I and the Father are so close. We are so close with each other. That he is in me and I am in him. In other words, I am him and he is me. Go with me one more time to another conversation. Go to uh, John. Go to the 21st chapter. Starting at verse 15. Another conversation between Jesus and this time Peter. 
When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Many of us may recognize and understand that this is a time and a place where Peter is called. It's called reinstating Peter. If you will remember just a short time before this, Peter had denied Jesus. Matter of fact, he denied Jesus three different times, and the third time even using swear words to try to prove to the people around him that he didn't have anything to do with Jesus. If you remember at the Lord's Supper, at the Last Supper, Jesus had a conversation with Peter and told Peter, said, before the crooster crows in the morning, you will have denied me three different times. This is after Peter looking at Jesus says, I will die for you. And yet, when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter ended up fleeing with the other disciples. A conversation had. A conversation between two individuals, between Jesus and between Peter. Another conversation between uh, Jesus and Philip. And another conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. All three of those uh, conversations were leading to certain places and to certain points, especially in those people's lives. Jesus told Peter to feed his sheep. Basically telling Peter, hey, listen, Peter, I understood what happened. I know who you are. I know where you're at. You're going to go, and you're going to lead, and you're going to help turn this world upside down for Jesus, which we know he did. Now, that brings me to a place and to a point that I want to have a conversation with us just a little bit this morning. I want, uh, if you would, in your mind's eye, to picture yourself someplace where you're by yourself. For somebody, it could be a coffee shop. For somebody, it could be out on the deer stand. For somebody else, it could be out riding a horse. Whatever it may be, you're out somewhere by yourself. And all of a sudden, you see this man approach you. And you recognize him to be Jesus. What would you think? Uh oh. Huh? What does this mean? <laughs> Is it my time? Is it ready for me to? I mean, and what if Jesus comes and he looks at you and he says, I would like to have a talk with you. I'd like to have a conversation with you. Now, most of us and many of us would probably think if I had the opportunity to talk to Jesus probably one of the very first things that we would do is we'd say I want to get all my questions answered uh how old is the earth really did the flood cover the entire earth or just the you know just enough to get the people uh you know how big was the ark I mean, you know, you could think of all those kinds of things that you probably, and most of the time, don't we, as people, if we think about having a conversation with Jesus, that probably would be one of the first things that we would go, one of the first places we'd go is, let me get some of my questions answered. But instead of our getting to ask the questions, what if Jesus came to us 
And the only thing Jesus asked us was, I want you to define our relationship. I want you to explain what our relationship is all about. Now, what if any of us could look and say, okay, I, I, I have a relationship. Uh, first off, how many of you would start stuttering probably? I'd be like, uh, what? Uh, you want to know what? He says, I want you to define our relationship. Hopefully there's none sitting in here today that would be able to look at him and honestly say, I don't really have a relationship with you because I really don't know you. I would hope that is not the case for anyone sitting here today. If it is, today's the day to change that. Because Jesus desperately wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us. But for those of us who say we are Christians, those of us who would look and we would say, I, 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 I go to church, I, I, I know about Jesus. If he were to come to us today and he would look at us and say, the fine our relationship how would we answer and what would be our answer you see really and truly I think Jesus is wanting us to try to get an understanding of what our relationship is to him how many of you know today that Jesus loves you do you know that? How many of you know how much Jesus loves you today? Do you know that? Do you know what it really took for him to go to a cross and to die for us? Do we really go to a place where when we think about this, we understand that Jesus not only took the brunt of a, of a beating, and the abuse of people, but he also bore my sin. Our sin. The sin of the world from beginning to end on himself. And said, I love you enough. that I will do this for you. When we try to take those things in, when we try our best to, to put or wrap our mind around those things, are we, are we able to fully grasp and are we able to fully understand what it was that Jesus did for us? Now this Jesus who did this for us now comes to me. I'm out by myself. We have the opportunity to divorce. Just me and him. There's no one else. And he looks at me and he says, Wendell, I want you to define the relationship that you and I have together. How do I answer him? How many of us might would answer uh, in this way? What if we answered like this? Well, uh, Jesus, I go to church. Uh, my parents and my grandparents are Christians. Uh, I even raised my hand during the sermon once before. 
Uh, I repeated a prayer after the preacher. Uh, I even went to the altar one time during a 12-minute altar call, altar call of just as I am. I own about five or six Bibles. My picture's in the church directory. I grew up going to vacation Bible school and going to church camp. My, my phone even has a ringtone that is a worship song. I'm able to use five different synonyms to be able to describe God. El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, those kinds of things. I wear a cross on my lapel. I, uh, I've read a book, and I agree with the guy that said that wrote about I kiss gate at the dating goodbye. Under my religious views on the face page, it says I'm a Christ follower. agree with the Harry Potter books and I like the Lord of Ring books. I even read a book called The 40 Days of Purpose. We're going through that right now. I even say bless their heart before I say something bad about them. I understand phrases like traveling mercies and sword drill. How many of you brought your sword with you today? You got your sword with you today? You see, brothers and sisters, so many times when we talk about and we think about defining our relationship with the Lord, we got to back to the I go to church. I know the names of God. I put money in the plate when it comes by. I sing loud on the songs that I know. Jesus looks and he says, I know and I understand all of these things that you're telling me, but I want you to define our relationship. You see how important it is that you and I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Going to church is 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 great. We had a conversation this morning in class about how important it is that we have a church family. I believe it to be very important that we have a church family. I believe it to be very important that we have a place to go to that we can love and support and care for each other. I believe all of those things are, are I believe it is necessary for us to have those things in our life. But you see, Going to church, brothers and sisters, doesn't define your relationship with Jesus Christ. It might say something about your relationship with Jesus Christ, but it doesn't define your relationship with Jesus Christ. Every time the plate comes by and you put a little money in it, doesn't doesn't define your relationship with Jesus Christ. It might say something about your relationship with Jesus Christ, but it doesn't define your relationship with Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to help us understand this morning is that I need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. How do I have a relationship with Jesus Christ? How do you and I have a relationship with each other? Communication. Talk. Harry and Betty have managed to be married for 63 years together. Now, I bet if I asked Harry and Betty 
what was probably one of the most important things to being able to stay married for 63 years, I bet you they, one, of the, one of the things that they would say right up there would probably be each other. On this for the other, You're, we're going to let y'all do a marriage counseling thing, okay? <laughs> You've had to talk to each other through the years. You've had to be able to communicate with the. I bet the two probably have known each other long enough, so much now, that you probably can communicate with each other even without talking to each other. Possibly. Horses helped out a whole bunch, she said. You see, brothers and sisters, let me let me ask you and put it to you this way in another way. How many of you are familiar with the story of when Jesus fed the 5,000? Jesus was out preaching, teaching. He had developed a following of 5,000 people. Now, we can debate and have debates talk about that in those days they counted the men and the men represented so you know the possibilities if that's the way that they did it the possibilities that there could have been 10 15 thousand people there because they counted the men the head of the house okay regardless whatever number that's a lot of people the bible tells us that jesus fed these people with two fish and five loaves of bread and when they finished, they had food left over. Now, I'm sure there's probably many that go, that's impossible. There's no way. Uh, again, I will tell you, I'm gullible enough to believe the story. I believe it happened. I believe Jesus being Jesus blessed that. And out of those two fish and five loaves of bread, he fed that many people. But he has this following of 5,000 people. And they're there. They have seen miracles. They have, they have uh, listened to Jesus teach. Not just, I mean, on many different subjects, on many different things. They've been there long enough that they've heard these things. And then all of a sudden, they, you, can't, you can't tell me that it didn't get around to the people what Jesus did. Because there were, you know, if you're in a group of 5,000, if you're standing in the middle of a 5,000, there's got to be probably at least a hundred people that could see you and see what you're doing. Don't you think that story spread like wildfire throughout the people? One tells the other, the other tells the other. So 5,000 people have just now witnessed Jesus being able to feed them with two fish and five loaves of bread. They get their fill, and afterwards, Jesus needs to get away. It ends up being, if you go on and read in the, in the chapter there, Jesus, that's, that's the time when Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee. That's when he actually walked on the water. I'm gullible enough to think that he walked on the water across the Sea of Galilee. Yes, I am. I, bl I believe he did that. He gets over to the other side. The disciples come over and follow him. All the 5,000 people get up. And they, they, uh, they realize Jesus isn't there. They start looking for Jesus. They start searching for Jesus. And they, they recognize that Jesus, they find out Jesus went over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So they all get in their boats, do all the things they need to do. They all get over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They all look for Jesus. They all find Jesus. And now Jesus looks at them and he tells them, I am the bread of life. And I am the water that if you take a drink of it, you'll never ever thirst again. If you read that story and you go further into that story, after him explaining to them that he is the bread of life and that he is the water that would, that would satisfy forever, we find out that a huge, huge number of them walk away and decided not to follow him after that.
That's after knowing that he fed them on the other side with two fish and five loaves of bread. That's after witnessing the miracles of someone being healed of whatever was bothering them. What do you think it was that those people were after when they went across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee? Could it be that they were so shallow enough to think that Jesus was going to feed them again because they were hungry and looking for breakfast? Could it be that instead of getting fed food, they got fed spiritual food? And they were no longer, they didn't, they didn't want the spiritual food, they wanted the physical food. That leads me to ask the question again this morning. If Jesus were to come and sit down and have a conversation with us, instead of our getting to ask the question, he wants to know the answer to just one question. How would you define our relationship? How many were left on the day of Pentecost that we know of for sure? What does the Bible mention? How many followers were left on the day of Pentecost? How many were in the upper room? The Bible says 120. From a following of 5,000 to 120 left. This morning, brothers and sisters, we've been talking an awful lot about revival and true revival coming and what that true revival means. I think for us to think about and talk about true revival, maybe we need to stop and take a look at how we would really define our relationship with Jesus Christ. First of all, do I have one? Second of all, is he to me who he is supposed to be? Third, am I doing all that I can to serve him? living out my purpose. You see, an awful lot of people were there, and they were there. How many of you are fair weather fans of your football teams? Boy, when old you's winning, phew. Woo! When the Cowboys win, we're all going, oh, it's you, right? <laughs> when we, uh, we're all with them when they're winning, right? My boy, when they start losing, good, yeah. Can't believe they did that. Can't believe they lost that game. That team should have never beat us. We turn around, we walk away, we don't we're, we don't care to watch anymore, we don't care to even follow them anymore. We just got so aggravated and so disgusted. You don't know what the definition is. An enthusiastic follower. As long as I've got something to be enthused about, I'll follow. (laughs) 
or maybe you're a dedicated fan. You're with them no matter what. Thick or thin, win or lose, you're there, you support them, they're okay, let's get them next week kind of attitude. For some of us, it's always, there's always next year, <laughs> you know. You see, there were an awful lot of people that were fans of Jesus Christ as long as they were getting fed. They were enthusiastic followers. But when it came down to getting what Jesus was really here for and what he was really trying to, to tell us about, to talk to us about, they were fair weather friends. They were fans. They were just enthusiastic followers. Until they weren't able to get what they thought they were supposed to get. And I say all of that this morning to ask us more time. This morning, if Jesus were to catch us out somewhere by ourselves and come and sit down and want to have a conversation with us, and he would look at me and he would ask the question, Wendell, define our relationship. How would I answer him? Would I be like so many of the 5,000 that fade away? Or would I be like the 120 who stayed and changed the world? Brothers and sisters, our relationship with Jesus Christ is of the utmost importance. Jesus doesn't want us just to know him. He doesn't want us just to know about him. He wants us to have a very deep personal relationship with Him. We get that deep personal relationship with Him by reading His Word, by prayer, by coming together. Brothers and sisters, it is through our communication with the Lord that we are able to develop that relationship. Jesus loves for you to talk to Him. You've heard me say many times, people look at me. When I'm in a vehicle by myself, I get strange looks all the time because I am having a conversation. And they look at me and go, who in the world is that crazy guy talking to? And many, many, many times, I'm having a conversation with the Lord. And a lot of times, those conversations are out loud conversations. Just talking with the Lord. You see, my definition of what I want is, uh, of with the Lord is I want, I want the Lord to know that my definition is, is that we have an intimate relationship with each other. I know Him he knows me. So I pose that question to us again this morning. One more time. How do I define my relationship with Jesus? Am I a fan of Jesus or am I committed to Jesus? Am I a fair weather fan that, that, that is... As, as long as everything's going great, it's okay, I'll follow, or am I, am I there for the long haul? Through thick or thin. Would I have the dedication of knowing that even if my life were in danger, I'm still going to be there. Or with the slightest little thread of someone picking on me or 
poking fun at me because I say I'm a Christian, am I ready to walk away? Or am I even ready, kind of like Peter did, to sacrifice my relationship with the Lord simply because somebody pointed a finger at me? How would you this morning define your relationship with the Lord? If you would, stand with me, please.